Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to HLB International's tax webinar series. Today we are doing Brexit 2.0, the final countdown to the, October, to the this January 31st, 2020 exit on Brexit. Um, we last did this webinar on the 26th of February. So we're gonna be spending today talking about what's changed in eight months, how it looks going forward and any lessons we've learned. Uh, on the panel today, we have Jason Maria Rathenham. He's a senior consultant with the HLB Netherlands. Carolyn Monk, who's the executive partner of HLB UK in Manchester. And Nick Farmer, who is the international tax partner of HLB UK in Men with Menzies. Welcome. Do you guys want to say anything else to introduce yourself, Jason? Oh, I just want to say I'm very happy to be here uh, in London at Brexit uh, headquarters, I would say. Uh, yeah, and just from, uh, from myself, Nick Farmer, I'd like to introduce my colleague here, Sean Turner from our VAT team as well. So he'll be here helping us um, through the issues that can arise from a trade and um, movement of goods perspective. Hello, everyone. Uh, and, and it's Caroline here from very rare to be able to say it, so I am enjoying saying it from a very sunny Manchester as opposed to the, the wet in London. So thank you. Great. So as we get started, we thought we'd first kind of talk about the history of what's happened in the past nine months. Um, and to do just a little bit of back history, Brexit was first passed in the in the UK on June 23rd, 2016. And they've gone through numerous times that they've planned the Brexit and it's been delayed. Back when we were speaking in February, the plan was that they would exit on March 29th. And as we know, that did not occur. So team, take it away. What's happened in the past eight months with respect to Brexit and the EU and the UK and the EU? Oh, well, if, if I just start that off, Kimberly, thank you very much. I think what's happened is just a, a bit of a muddle, really. Um, in the, as you say, Brexit was, was voted through the referendum in 2016, um, and the decision maker invoked the Article 50 was, was taken in 2017, which led us to the exit date of, of um, March 29th, 2019. And since then, very little has happened. Parliament has been absolutely stuck, not knowing quite what, which way they want to go. Um, and we've been stuck in a bit of no man's land that, that continued from the March date to an extension to October and now through to, to January. Um, and as we were just discussing before, before the webinar started, um, really now it rests on what will happen in this, this election with the results in December. Um, will will dictate largely whether we will be um, enacting a Brexit exit agreement that Boris has, has, has presented uh, at the end of January or stuck in no man's land for some more time. I don't know if Nick wants to add to that. Yeah, I guess the key thing that, that changed there, Caroline, was that um, clearly, you know, back in uh, March, we had, you know, a different prime minister, Theresa May. Uh, and she mm -hmm. tried to get her deal through Parliament three times and failed, and consequently uh, resigned after that. We then went through a um, conservative um, internal election process to end up with our now current Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who then went and renegotiated the deal uh, because he wasn't happy or, or Parliament wasn't happy with what Theresa May had negotiated. And although the deal itself doesn't get onto a lot of the aspects around trade and what our future trade relationship will look like, the key thing that they were trying to renegotiate across that period of time was about the Irish border and how that would be dealt with. And that's really been the sticking point in most of the uh, negotiations anyway. Um, I think if the Irish border hadn't been... Uh, uh, an issue here, then uh, Brexit would probably have uh, occurred by now. But that's the bit that Parliament hasn't been able to um, agree on. And Boris Johnson went and renegotiated that. Uh, so he came back with a new deal, which again, um, he couldn't get through um, Parliament before the end of um, uh, 31st of October, which was the, uh, the deadline there. So that's now been moved to the end of January. 
and really what the conservatives uh, the uh, government in power have now um sought to do and it's been agreed by the um, opposition parties is to have a general election um, as a way of trying to break this Brexit deadlock uh, to try and return a government um, to power that has a majority in order to be able to get things done through Parliament. That's what the Conservatives are hoping for. Whether that's how things will play out on the 12th of uh, December is another matter. I mean, ask the British public a question, you'll probably get a different answer than one you expect. So, you know, right now, I think we are just waiting. We're waiting for that election to come on the 12th of December. Um, the outcome of that election, in my mind, will really determine whether if we get a majority government for the Conservatives, then it looks like there will be enough energy to get Brexit over a line by the end of, um, of January. Their deal will be one which they, they support and they'll have a majority to get it through Parliament. If we don't get a majority um, Conservative government, um, perhaps we've got a majority Labour government, then they'd be looking to renegotiate the deal all over again with the um, EU and they'd be putting that to a second referendum, that's what they've said, and if we don't get any form of majority and we just get a hung parliament where no one party can actually uh, um, govern on its own, then all bets are off really, you've got no way of knowing whether anything will be able to get through parliament because it looks like you'll be starting all over again really with new people, new MPs, um, you know, so that is a crucial date really in the Brexit timeline now, it wasn't one which is a uh, uh, being sort of uh, uh, pushed on us by the EU, it's what the UK government have decided is required to actually break the deadlock. So I think anybody looking at Brexit from afar has to look to that date as a 12th of December and what the outcome is, if you're going to see how this may finally sort of uh, get resolved. Absolutely, I agree. I agree with everything you've just said there, Nick. Um, and and. And, and almost regardless of, of where your, your thoughts were on the outcome, we just want we, we just need a, an outcome that means we can move forward. Yep, I understand that. Now, um, I, and I'm interested to get your views on this, Jason. Sitting here in the US, we are very swept up in our upcoming elections, which are 11 plus months away. And here you have an election in a few short weeks. And, from the US, we've heard very little about your elections. How's the whole election process going? And, and do you have any predictions? I know, uh, Nick, you just I mean, set up a, a hung parliament, so. Yeah, right now it's very difficult um, to predict this. I mean, pollsters are out there and you'll see swings happening every day. Small things may happen, which will swing things one way or another. Often you find that momentum shifts happen in the lead up to the actual um, uh day itself so it's very difficult to forecast three weeks out how this may actually go and then of course you know the voting that occurs will be on a constituency basis so you're not voting on a national basis here so we're not voting for a national party we're voting for our local constituency so it's a very local vote that takes place you then through those local votes return an mp to parliament and across the country, there are about 630 MPs, and you just add up the number that represent each party. So it's very difficult. If we sit in London and uh, the southeast, we would have a different view on what is likely to occur from the election than perhaps somebody in the north of the country or the southwest of the country. So it can be very regional, the, uh, the voting that's likely to take place. If you get a gauge from where things are in the press, it seems that right now no one party is probably going to um, command a majority. That would be, I think, where the sort of most likely outcome is. But like I say, there's still three weeks to go. Things can happen. You know, momentum does sort of shift with, with parties closer to the date. If a party was likely to form a government, then it would probably be the uh, Conservative government. Um, they seem to have got the highest standing in the polls right now, if those are, are, are led to, uh, to be believed. Um, but if the outcome is a sort of a deadlock, no one party, then, and it doesn't look like any of those parties really seem to want to work together either. So 
if you do get to a point where no one party actually commands majority, often what happens is then two parties come together to form that majority, but the parties themselves seem to be very different in what they're, um, um, what they're, 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 they're standing for, and therefore to actually see those parties coming together looks like it would be very difficult to achieve. So yeah, I think this was designed to break the deadlock. It could just lead to more uncertainty right now is the way that I would view it. Um, Caroline, if you've got any uh, thoughts on that? No, no, I'd agree totally, Nick. I think the point you make about uh, the electoral system in the UK and, and the constituency base means that that um, the results will really hang on some key um, key areas where where there's a very close sort of tie between first and second party, and 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 that works across all sorts of, of divides. So we've got some some critical seats where where the the Tories are, are fighting with with Lib Dems, and we've got some some classic some some um, critical seats where it's it's a Tory Labour um, division, and then you've got the added sort of complexity of Brexit Party within those seats. So so it becomes really difficult to predict um, in these these areas where it could be down to to just a few hundred votes that that makes all the difference. Um, so no, I'm I'm not going to put a prediction on. Oh, um, I I believe that people way way cleverer than me on on analysing statistics. But so far the polls haven't haven't been very um accurate in the outcomes, have they? So no, but I, I guess the thing here that we're kind of working towards and saying is that you can't really be certain of what's going to happen with Brexit until that election takes place. You probably won't be certain after it, but that moment is a very key moment in the timeline. So we've recounted the timeline that took place from the actual referendum itself back in June 2016. Well, actually this date here of the 12th of December is gonna be a very key date in the actual timeline mm -hmm. for Brexit. It's gonna it's going to make a massive difference what the outcome of that is. Great. Okay. Now, now um, on to the business questions, I, I will say, um, and to our participants, if you have any questions, there is a chat box through the GoToWebinar app. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send those to us and we will, I will address them to our panelists. Um, first, you know, the small and medium enterprises represent a vast majority of the UK businesses and they're facing many issues, not just Brexit. Um, do you want to discuss some of the other issues that they're facing and how Brexit might impact this or the lack of understanding or confirmation of where Brexit is going, how that's impacting our small and medium enterprises? Certainly. Should I kick that off, Nick, um, with some yeah, thoughts cool. here? So, so I think within the UK, and I'm sure this is mirrored across, across many um, areas, um, the small and medium-sized entities make up the, the huge majority of, of businesses. Um, and, and bluntly for, for these companies, um, Brexit planning hasn't, it is still not top of their agenda. They, they have as, as plenty of other challenges, as I'm sure are, are reflected across the world. So um, we talked about, you know, technology is, is a disruptor across all sectors, recruitment, talent, which has a Brexit connection but, but recruitment is, a, is an issue for these businesses regulatory requirements gdpr that came in um, um, is important um, so i think it's just important to to, to realize that that brexit is is just one of many issues facing companies at the moment um, many of the other issues are connected to brexit but uh, are kind of sat on, on the side and, and possibly more important at the moment, availability of finance, um, dealing with late payment regime. Those are those are those are typical issues that we, we hear from SMEs. I don't know again if Nick has anything to add in that respect. Uh, yeah, I mean certainly I think I think the thing is that that Brexit to some extent is obviously a bit of a distraction for people running their business. They just have to deal with the uh, the day to day, I mean, it's very difficult to uh, to plan when there's that uncertainty around, but you've still got to get on and, and run your business, deal with those challenges there on the screen in terms of the sort of the technology, getting good recruitment. There's still new regulations that are, are coming people's uh, way that they've got to deal with. Um, and you've got to remember a lot of these 
businesses are actually trading internationally. Um, so they are actually uh, having to continue to, to trade with EU customers and import goods from the EU. And that doesn't stop. I mean, it doesn't get put on hold. You've got to keep running your business. So what a lot of businesses have done, of course, is have a look at how they may be impacted from, uh, from Brexit, try and do uh, a health check on their business, identify the areas which are perhaps at risk when Brexit happens. But because Brexit has continually been pushed down the line, to some extent, people just have to get on with their business and only when there's an absolute definite date when that's going to occur, do I think they'll press the button on some of the things that they're sitting there uh, knowing they may need to do, but aren't going to action until you know they absolutely have to, because there's cost involved in, in some of the decisions that may arise from Brexit. I agree. Great. And that kind of leads us very nicely into our next question, which is what are the priorities around Brexit? Um, you know, if you can tack to the single market access arrangements, how, how you're going to go forward post Brexit. And Sean, I'd be interested to hear your take on, on how that is going to change if once Brexit actually happens. Sorry, shall I shall I just sort of give yeah. an initial thought while Sean yeah. gathers together? Yeah. I think, um, as, as Nick referred to, Brexit is is kind of sat there in everyone's mind, but without actually thinking through, without actually becoming top of a priority for action plans at the moment. Um, but I think if you were to ask um, ask an SME owner um, what what he would want, accepting that Brexit is happening. He, he, you know, he, she would want um, arrangements for single market access as quickly um, and as smoothly as possible. That that access to that single market is really seen as, as key um, key to, to to UK businesses. And I'm sure Sean will be able to talk a little bit more, whether now or, or later on in the, the presentation, um, about just how important the, those arrangements are to UK businesses. And I think picking up on that, that's the single market access, but the, the point on the screen there also about these new trade deals is absolutely key because, you know, I think about half of our exports go to the EU, but obviously a lot of our client SME businesses are dealing with non-EU um, customers and, you know, currently they're covered by the um, uh, EU trade agreements that are in place as soon as we leave the um, uh, EU, then those will fall away. And right now, I think the UK has got deals in place which cover about 8% of total trade. So that's not a great percentage of deals to have in place when you're likely to um, be sort of um, you know, needing to have these trade deals for your businesses that are um, trading in other parts of the world. Um, so we have got some continuity agreements already signed up. These are ones that will come in place to replicate what, what the EU uh, agreements are. Uh, some of the key ones that we, we already have are with um, Switzerland, which I think is about 2% of our international trade. We've got other ones with countries like Israel and South Korea, which is, is quite a big one actually. But they are saying that we will not be in a position to have trade deals in place with countries like Japan. So currently mm -hmm. a UK exporter that's selling into Japan will be able to deal with under the terms which the UK has got, sorry, the EU has got with uh, Japan, which is, which is typically a free trade agreement, actually. And suddenly if we leave the EU, we're not going to have any specific deal with them. We're going to be on WTO terms. And actually, for some sectors, that could be a significant cost to doing business in that, that country. So I think, yes, there are two sides to this. One is the single market access, which is, a, is a, you know, obviously very important. But actually, these trade deals and getting those in place um, is an ongoing challenge. And it looks like, you know, especially if the UK is going to leave the EU next year, that these just will not be there and we will only have a percentage of our uh, agreements in place. That means there could be a high cost of business in doing business uh, in other parts of the world. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I think Japan, you you mentioned, is a key is a key concern there. But but there are there are other very significant trading partners that we we just don't have any idea or any understanding yet of what that trading position will be and what what the potential tariff position will be. And and without that, it, with with that continued uncertainty, it seems like you know your your small to medium enterprises they don't have the information to um, assess and plan how, what the impact of Brexit will be. We you've spoken a lot about exporting out of the UK, but what about also importing from other parts of the world or, or from Europe? And that might impact your small medium enterprises. How do they how do they can kind of Brexit proof themselves or make sure that they're secure? now and once we do have a brexit agreement how have you been working with your clients on that so sean can jump in on this one i think yeah i think from an indirect tax customs duty point of view um the uncertainty is the is the problem here um lots of clients are coming and saying what do we do how do we plan well really all you can really do is plan for the worst case scenario and, and plan for a no deal brexit um, but even then, it's, it's still a bit in the dark as to what exactly is going to happen. Um, I mean, from the UK point of view, HMRC had put in certain measures um, which they've advised businesses to, to adopt. Um, they even went down the route now of automatic enrolments for certain things where they're trying to get businesses geared up and prepared for potential uh, impact of Brexit. Um, but at the moment, that is all that can really be done. Um, Things I'm talking about there are EORI, I think we'll come on to some of this later, EORI, um, TSP, Transitional Simplified Procedures, um, there's talk of other things such as free zones, but at the moment it's still too up in the air and all businesses can do is prepare for what they think might be the worst and that's all we can advise them at this stage. I, I, I agree, Sean, um, but of course the reality I think is, is the point that Nick made before that, that um, Whilst whilst there is uncertainty as to what Brexit really means, um, your your typical SME business is is reticent to to go into great expense in planning for a, a worst case scenario that that might not happen. Um, and whether that's kind of just looking the other way until the last minute or not, I don't know. But that's that's what it is. There is plenty of help available. I mean, the Chambers of Commerce have got some very good checklists. And, and guidance notes. I know our, our institute have as well. So there is there is a lot of assistance or a lot of assistance to point you in the right direction available. It's just just taking those steps that is is the issue. Yeah, that's right. I agree. There's 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 talk in in, in the industry of people um, hiring um, staff, customs brokers to be trained up um, in readiness okay. for what was the March deadline. Now that's a January 31st deadline, or maybe even not that. And this staff, this this um, resource that people have invested in are, are possibly sitting around doing doing not a lot at the moment because there is nothing that they can do. So yeah, yeah. I, I agree with your, people are reluctant, especially SMEs, to actually invest and put the time and money into these things just yet. I, uh, Mrs. Jason here, I can add a little bit of a European perspective. We had a lot of uh, British perspective, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, EU should have a little bit of a say here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad look, you're jumping in, Jason. Uh, look, the EU was founded on four very simple uh, freedoms. One is the freedom of the movement of goods, movement of freedom and movement of capital, freedom to establish and provide services, and the freedom of movement of persons. This is the founding principles in the EU. And a test, I guess, as a business that you can do is see whether th these freedoms are going, uh, you're going to be impacted by them. Um, what at least we see is a lot of businesses are having an alarm clock. I think Nick and I talked about this in the morning. And I think the alarm clock, clock is one of the best inventions that were ever created. But one of the worst inventions that was added on to the alarm clock was the snooze button. Uh, <laughs> And, and what companies are doing right now is they're just hitting the snooze button. Um, and I agree that there's a lot of uncertainty on which way the deal is going to go and how Brexit is going to turn out. But there are some insurance policies that you can take. Um, one of the insurance policies that you can take is if you are doing heavy business with Europe and you are uh, trading a lot with European countries, 
and maybe even a particular country, one of the simple things that you can do is set up a local entity. That's, for me, an insurance policy. It cost, doesn't cost that much, uh, maybe a couple of thousand euros on yearly maintenance, but at least you have a local entity there, maybe even a local bank account. You can, I think we'll talk a little bit later about bank accounts and some of the challenges there, but at least you'll have a backup plan that if everything goes wrong, worst case scenario, you have uh, an entity that you can trade off in, in, in Europe um, to protect your, the, the, the continuity of your business. So I would uh, uh, do a check to see how those four freedoms that I talked about uh, will impact your business. And I mean, Jason, just picking up on that point, um, that certainly has occurred with some of uh, the SMS, SME businesses that we talk to, that they know that they will need a European entity in order to contract with European customers. That is a regulatory requirement in their sector, whether you're in insurance or financial services or in sort of uh, chemicals or something like that, you will need a European entity. And so some of the, and actually that doesn't happen overnight. Firstly, it takes a bit of time to establish and actually to get it operational and actually to find the right people to, uh, to work in that business. So some, some clients where they, some businesses where they know that's gonna be a requirement have taken that step and they are sort of at the moment dealing with it in a light touch way. So rather than fully staffing that business, they may just have it sitting there in some instances, they may, may put new customers into that and keep the existing customers on the UK company's books. They may likely staff it with one or two people in that office. And it's there available to be switched on and obviously uh, to uh, you know, uh, uh, build in, in size if and re when uh, required. And actually, you know, if Brexit doesn't occur, then they can still trade through that business and it can still be a, a useful kind of um, part of their actually you know, their, their overall operating structure. So I think Brexit for different sectors does mean different things. Some sectors have had to make a move already. Other sectors where you know, they don't necessarily require an establishment in Europe to continue to trade. You may be a service business that doesn't, you can still, will be, still be able to trade with European customers afterwards from the, uh, from the UK. You may not find that there's actually too much that actually uh, restricts your actual trading day-to-day um, uh, -day, uh, aspects of the business, those businesses aren't obviously going to be investing in a, in a European entity uh, at the moment. So, yeah, it is actually very sector-specific, actually, as to what people are doing right now, I would say. I, I agree, Nick, totally. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's much more to add there. It is, it is exactly as you say. We, we've started to get into this a little bit, like if we end up on January 31st with no parliament, with no deal, and there's a no deal Brexit, you know, can you talk about that? That's kind of like, you know, we've all said prepare for the worst, plan for the best, or plan for the worst and hope for the best. So mm -hmm. well, what if the worst comes? What if there's a no deal Brexit? How can SMEs, how can anybody start to deal with that? And what should they be doing to plan and what should they be? holding on so we can do it in two sides i think sean will take care of uh, from a uk perspective and then i'll, I'll pull on a european uh, view on okay that. Go ahead, sean. okay okay i mean there's been lots of uh, information out there on, on indirect taxes and customs duties from hmrc since brexit was first mentioned there's reams and reams of guidance um businesses are being told what they should do um what they should apply for and it's now got to the stage really where HMRC have been pushing them down that route. So everyone's been auto enrolled for TSP, who trades in goods with EU member states. Everyone has been issued with an EORI number, an Economic Operator Registration and Identification number, which allows um, import and export declarations to be done. Um, there is money available in grants for, for training staff and having IT systems in place for the expected increase in customs declarations that are required. We're talking about the introduction of what's called postponed import VAT accounting, uh, where rather than making a customs declaration and then paying the import back at a later date and reclaiming it, you can actually account for that on your VAT return in real time, which is a, a cash flow easement, if you like. 
So these are the things which um, are there, they're available. Businesses need to sort of adopt those as much as they can and be aware of them. Um, so really HMRC are, are putting all that guidance out there, but until we actually know what is going to happen, all businesses can do is, is react to that in the best way they can and bring some of these measures on board. And, and, and remember here, what is the difference between a deal and a no deal? Well, a no deal means that you know we drop out of the EU as at that date, and broadly, you know, you're you're trading uh, on World Trade Organization terms or whatever. Um, you know, the UK is agreeing in terms of uh, goods coming into the UK. If you get a, a deal in place, broadly, what it's saying is that. For a period of time, and it's up until the 31st of December 2020, we will remain as part of the um, customs union and single market, and they will try and work out a trade deal across that course of time. So actually, having a exiting with a deal just means that we've got a bit more time to transition, rather than actually having a hard moment in time where perhaps on the 31st of January we just fall out and you actually don't have any agreement with the EU and what that relationship's going to look like, what the deal will mean is that we've got a period of time to try and negotiate that. But a lot of people are saying, actually, you know, the, the period over which you've got to negotiate it is until the 31st December 2020. That in itself is a ridiculously short period of time. Doing trade deals with the EU, and Jason will, I'm sure, have a view here, takes years. Canada took seven years to negotiate their, their trade deal with the EU. I think the South American um, uh, uh, countries took 20 years to negotiate theirs. So the UK trying to do it in 11 months looks extremely uh, optimistic. Yeah, I, I think we've had uh, in the last two to three years a lot of optimistic talk. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I guess we're addressing this to the business community. Um, and what, the one thing that bis the business community does not like is uncertainty. And if you don't like uncertainty, there are a few things that you can do to eliminate that so that you're prepared for the worst. Now, uh, on the sheet, you'll see that there's three points. There's stock building, uh, export barriers, and import delays. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the trends that are happening on mainland Europe, uh, particularly the port of Rotterdam. Um, Rotterdam, or the Netherlands, is known as the gateway into um, Europe. It's, uh, it's, uh, some of my European uh, colleagues might disagree, but uh, the Netherlands, that's how they promote themselves as the gateway into Europe. We see um, a lot of companies um, overstocking themselves in warehouses um, in the Netherlands, for a few reasons. One is um, they work with big um, uh, e-commerce platforms such as Amazon. And in the fine print, if you are a business and you are signing a deal with Amazon, in the fine print of Amazon, there'll be a clause there that talks about fines if on deliver, uh, late delivery of products to end customers. Not many people um, read that because they think ah, it's all going to be on time, we'll always meet the requirement. But Amazon does impose fines uh, to companies who fail to deliver products within a certain given of time. And they've also, in, in Amazon started doing this about five, six, maybe even seven years ago when they were acquiring clients to demand that if you are in a business that um, trades physical goods, that you have a uh, mainland Europe distribution center, a tree, whether you use your own or you hire a 3PL company, they, they require you to do that. Um, and that, that you, you should be seriously considering the uh, potential impact if you can't meet the terms set by your uh, e-commerce platform, in this case uh, Amazon or whatever other uh, platform you're using, that there could be potential fines if you don't deliver on time. Now that's, and that's one reason why you do stock building. Yes, it'll cost you a bit more money. Uh, inventory cost is going much more higher. Your balance sheet looks much more heavier. But at least you can be able to supply to your customers. Um, now, coming back to Nick's point on a no-deal Brexit, if there's a no-deal and we uh, uh, the UK leaves uh, the EU without a deal, that could potentially mean that 
any new product coming into the EU will be hit with a, uh, a tax because we will treat all uh, new products coming to EU as if it was coming from anywhere around the world. Yep. In, in, in principle, that, that's how we will see it. If you do not have a deal with us, you're just as good as, uh, 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 I don't know, Malaysia or Singapore sending us goods to the EU. It will be treated just like anyone else. Um, and that could be quite painful for, for companies. So uh, again, we come back to the, again, the question about a legal entity. And uh, I'm glad Sean mentioned about uh, the postponement of VAT. Uh, there are a few countries in Europe that do postponement of VAT. And the Netherlands is one of them, and that was actually the, the reason, more, most reasons why Port of Rotterdam was famous. And now it's interesting to see that the UK is uh, thinking about doing that as well. So it's a good, uh, healthy competition here. <laughs> Great. Okay, we're going to shift gears just a little bit away from trade and talk about what are some of the workforce concerns. We did discuss some of these in February. I'm not sure that it changed much, but if we could kind of circle back and say, what should the workforce be concerned with? You know, the current employees that are currently working overseas, and how does this impact future employees? Oh, okay, thanks, Kimberly. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of kick up with a few thoughts on this, but. But it's absolutely, you know, we, we can we can get talking about um, the movement of goods and, and the paperwork and, and the, the implications and the costs and, and clearly they're all very important. But but deep down we do have to remember that, that this affects people and, and, and it's really, really significant to people, whether those are EU nationals um, living in, in the UK at the moment or um, UK nationals wanting to either work or live in in the eu and it becomes a real issue for them so so we've had a, a few developments i think over the period since we spoke in february in terms of of um people related matters um and the progression of the the settled status um position for eu nationals in the uk i i suspect that system isn't working as seamlessly as would have been liked but i think that's always going to be the case when there's such a big change um, in processes but at least there has been some movement on there um, there's also been a bit more talk about that for the future business travel in europe and, and, and the, the ability of uk nationals to be able to travel around the eu um, without need of visas um, and that, that would clearly be very important, I think. We've become used to being able to do that, and, and I think that would be, be seen as a hamper if we weren't able to do that. Um, but we just need to, to, um, to see how that works as the legislation comes through. And then the other important sort of question that's still, still not really known is, is, is about professional qualifications. Will our, our qualifications in the UK um, be relevant in the EU? We already know. Um, Nick referred to financial services before, but the financial services um, sector are going to have to look very much at, at basing themselves locally in the EU. Um, other areas are still are still undecided, and we you know we just do not know from the legislation yet what what position will be. Yeah, I think um, I think this area, the workforce concern, is the big area for the service sector businesses. I mean, they're clearly very different from you know, the companies that are exporting or importing goods. If you're a service sector business, then a lot of what you're looking to do is get the talent in the right place to be able to hire the people you need for your, your business. And if there's uncertainty that people are going to have the right to come and live and work in the UK, then that you know, does start to cause difficulties across lots of uh, a lot across lots of um, sectors so we're definitely seeing that in the service sector in a tech community where you know um, London itself has a very very buoyant um, tech uh, hub here um, you know it's one of, one of the tech hubs of of Europe and some of the tech businesses are um, talking about finding it certainly difficult to attract talent and the fact that this could be a big problem for them going forward and then you hear about it in other sectors such as the agricultural sector where you know uh, again they're reliant on overseas workers coming into the uh, the uk um, seasonal workers and how those people will be viewed and the uncertainty here again is from the fact that at the moment we do not have a, 
sort of a settled picture of what our immigration policy will look like um, post Brexit. And they're talking about having a sort of a points based um, system. And certainly, you know, that may come with a minimum salary that needs to be paid. But that itself is not settled. Immigration is one of those areas which has been um, consistently uh, changing um, in relation to overseas uh, nationals coming working in the UK. Clearly, it's been fine for EU nationals, but once that we, we leave the EU, they'll be viewed like anybody else coming and working in the UK. And I think that's where the problem arises. That again, businesses do not know what that policy will will look like and it is still something that is being shaped and will only actually come into force um, post December 2020. So that, that's something that, again, that they're, they're talking about will have to sort of take a bit of time to uh, come into place. That's, that's right. The other, the other sector that I'm, I've been um, working with and I'm, I'm conscious it's a big worry for them is in the, the sort of fashion and the creative um, sectors. Um, and, and I think they're, you know, the, the talk about a point system and, and a salary based in sort of immigration um, is of concern for, for um, startup businesses and startup, you know, people at the start of that, that career, um, career path. And if we, if we cut ourselves off to that pipeline of talent, um, the repercussions on the industry could be quite significant. Right. Okay. Now, taking a slightly different tack, because we've covered so many of these issues already, but I want to look at this from a different perspective, from a, a perspective of a startup company. And we've had a question, you know, we're a startup company that will operate online, looking to reach customers worldwide. And we might have product that we manufacture in the UK and export, or we might have product coming from overseas and either coming through the UK or going direct to consumer. So what are some of the issues that a, a startup online company might face? We've often had these issues in the US where our tax law at the federal and at the state levels just can't keep up with the changes in business models. So to add into that the layer of Brexit and what are we looking at? Oh, this is this is quite complicated, I think. Yeah. Um, so we'll have to try to stay at the thirty thousand foot view. We we have a we only have about fifteen seventeen minutes left, so no, no, <laughs> we have a fine. few more slides to go, so we can't dive in absolutely. too deep. No, 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 absolutely. But I mean, you know, operating online opens up a whole spectrum of of um, factors to consider, and I'm I'm talking really while Sean uh, has a chance to gather his thoughts and and see what what comments he'd like to add on to that. In actual fact, we've had an example of this, uh, which fits this quite quite nicely, fairly recently, where we had um, a company based in Dubai, in fact, um, that was sourcing um, various parts of um, of a suit, so a shirt, um, a jacket, the shoes from different EU member states, and selling online into the UK. Um, it kind of nicely sort of sums up what you've got on the slide there because that that company well if it was to start trading after brexit um faces quite a few things which it needs to consider now before brexit and then also after brexit um distance selling for example so it may well fall under the distance selling rules now the distance selling rules will will probably go after brexit you've got free movement of the goods from um the EU member states into the uk at the moment after Brexit, you've got import declarations, import VAT, customs duty. Um, they are just a few of the things which we which we came up with for this uh, potential client of ours. Um, there's things it needs to consider now and also after Brexit. So there's a lot of preparation there for this business before it sets about um, trading in, in this way. Um, do you keep stocks? Where housing? Where do you put that? Um, you've got up there delays at the border. Um, duty relief schemes, can these things be brought into play as well? There's so much to consider um, and that's just a, a very quick um, example, quite a straightforward example of just buying and selling goods between member states now and also how it might look after any Brexit. And one of the things that we've seen, and I'll, I'll pass over to Jason because he'll have a view on this as well I'm sure, is that where businesses are in the retail um, sector uh, and they previously may have actually brought all their goods into the UK and then um, sold them on to customers across the EU. 
they're now looking at you know the UK market perhaps as a different market to the uh, EU market and perhaps bringing goods specifically into the UK market but also taking goods into the EU and warehousing them there so that they're not having to sort of uh, take them across um, multiple borders and you know they're sort of re-engineering their supply chain here so that the flow of the goods is really already starting to uh, um, uh, take into account what may be required post-Brexit. So the UK market specifically targeted, obviously you'll bring your goods in here, but it may make sense to also warehouse your goods somewhere in the EU. And I guess this is where I might pass to Jason, because actually where you decide to actually warehouse your your goods in the EU. We've seen some clients do that through the Netherlands. We've seen other people actually set up warehouses further afield in places like Poland and, uh, and Spain. So actually the choice of where you take your goods into the EU if you're looking to target the EU market is actually quite an interesting one. Yeah, thanks Nick. I was a bit distracted by uh, the pumpkin cheesecake that popped up. Uh... <laughs> Sorry about that guys. <laughs> I, mean, I know that Thanksgiving is uh, not too far away in, for our friends yeah. in the States. <laughs> um, coming back to what Nick was talking about, um, uh, an interesting exercise is the uh, reverse engineering or, or reverse supply chain. So you work from your customers back to um, your whole supply chain from the factory and all that. So uh, your, your question earlier about startups, um, it would be a good exercise to figure out where your customers are based uh, wherever around the world. and. Um, a good indication is if there is a big cluster, and I think you can do this on Google, and, and there are a couple of tools out there that you could put all your customers' information, or at least with the countries your customers are there, and then you could um, see where they are. If you see a big amount clustered in one specific area, say Northern Europe or Southern Europe, it would be that's how you should make a decision on where you'd want to uh, have your supply chain or have your 3PL set up. Uh, but you work your way backwards from the customer. What are they uh, where are they located? What are their requirements? And then you uh, see uh, um, what kind of setup works best to A, deliver the quality uh, that you need. B, uh, speed is, is a very important thing nowadays, um, especially if you are operating in the retail world. Uh, in the past, speed was not such the, the biggest issue when it came to B2B. It was not, such, uh, not, not so much of an issue, but nowadays they want overnight shipment. If I make an order before five o'clock in the evening or sometimes it's seven o'clock in the evening, the next morning it should be there. You have players that are, are in the market that are making these kind of commitments and it's going to be a norm, um, especially for the retail market, uh, to be able to deliver. And that might uh, require you to be as close to, uh, to your customers. Uh, as possible. I think just picking up on something there, what Jason said about working backwards, we, we've had um, large customers in the UK push their, their EU suppliers back saying if there's no deal Brexit or Brexit, you're registering in the UK, we're not doing the customs declaration, you're going to bring those goods in yourself, pay the duty, do the import declaration and sell on to us, otherwise we're not going to trade with you. So contractual terms, inco terms, how you delivered, um, who's paying the duty in the VAT, that's all things to, um, to bear in mind going forward and yeah, perhaps do work backwards. Well, of course, you see, when you look at it like that, a no deal is absolutely dreadful for business, isn't it? Because you don't have time yeah. to prepare for that. At least if there's a deal, you might have this transitional period of, well, if it's 11 months, to actually work through what that will then look like and actually get yourself ready to trade because you know it's going to happen at that date. Great. Now, I, I, I want to spend just a tiny bit of time. We have 11 minutes left talking about what are some of the double tax concerns and how we can look at that, um, how we'd address those, you know, will we have double tax concerns? I know, Sean, you've talked a lot about the import and export VAT, but any anything new to add on this or can we move on to other currency issues and contract issues? I think one of the things to add here, Kimberly, is that at the moment, whilst the UK is in the EU, we have access to the EU directives. Um, now, these may not be things that people hear a lot about, but they actually underpin 
an awful lot in terms of the way that the tax system works between the uh, EU countries. So each country is sovereign in its own taxing rights. It can uh, have its own tax rate. It can run its own tax system. It can, to some extent, introduce incentives provided that they get EU kind of approval. But one thing that underpins the way that the countries interact are the EU directives. Now, these may be in terms of businesses when they actually um, merge between countries or when you're flowing funds between countries. And if we leave the EU, we're going to lose access to those directives and we're going to have to pull back on um, double tax treaties. Now, there are tax treaties between the UK and every single one of the uh, 27 member member states. So, you know, we will have tax treaties in place, but there will then be a cost to doing business. So in a very simple example, at the moment, if a UK company has a, a German subsidiary, that German subsidiary, if it makes profit, can pay off a dividend to the UK, and there's no withholding tax in Germany uh, because the EU directive, the EU parent subsidiary directive, will eliminate withholding tax in Germany. When we leave and we lose that directive, we'll then have to look at the treaty rates, and there'll be a 5% minimum withholding tax that will apply on the repatriation of funds out of um, Germany to the UK. And Germany is just one example. I think when you look across the tax treaties, probably there's probably about you know a dozen or so that will mean that flowing funds from that country up to the UK in terms of a dividend repatriation of profit, there's going to be an additional cost. There's also issues there with any interest or any royalty payments that move between uh, the UK and these jurisdictions. At the moment, you wouldn't expect there again there to be any withholding tax, but uh, if we leave the EU, then there will be withholding tax between some of the countries and the UK because the tax treaties will not eliminate that withholding tax. So. Unfortunately, there are these kind of silent agreements in place that are actually really facilitating business uh, tax efficiently across the uh, EU borders. And if we lose those, unfortunately, the treaties, although they're good and they're better than not having treaties, will not replicate them. And there will be a cost to business if they are actually uh, moving funds um, between um, entities set up around Europe. So I think that is a, there are issues here from a tax point of view, um, which are more than just the movement of goods. There are actually issues from a, a direct tax point of view as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, um, Nick. And then and the other issue that, that sort of can easily be overlooked just within all of this, um, the, the reference to insurance, um, we've already referred, Jason referred to perhaps looking at building up stock levels um, ahead of any Brexit date so that you can preserve your um, availability of goods to, to fulfil orders. Um, but we are we are seeing um, clients who, who have inadvertently exposed themselves to a risk there because their insurance covered um, isn't sufficient for the level of stock that they are now looking to hold at these cut-off points. So it, it's just a, a reminder, really, that whilst we, whilst when we talk Brexit, we think immediately about the movement of goods and the customs and the duty implications, that there are a sort of other aspects that are, are perhaps overlooked if we're not careful. Great. And some of those other issues we've, we're going to talk about right here with the currency and contracts and intellectual property. I know you touched on royalty withholding. Um, how how is the market already factored Brexit in, and uh, you know what do you think will be the impact of Brexit on in negotiating contracts and currency exchanges, or for example, being paid between the EU and the UK? I mean, currency mm. was obviously one of the immediate impacts of the referendum, wasn't it? That actually, you know, the uh, the pound weakened considerably at that that moment and to some extent although it has sort of recovered a, a, a little bit it is still you know much weaker than it was uh pre the uh the referendum so currency is it is always going to be a, a factor here in terms of 
the cost perhaps to uh, to doing business. There are some some winners in terms of that. You know, businesses that that clearly sort of export um, from a currency point of view. You know, they have benefited from the uh, the weaker uh, currency. But there is instability there. We do see movements. We do see daily movements when announcements get made around. Uh, what's happening in the negotiations between the UK and the EU when things sound very positive, the pound strengthens a bit and then it may sort of fall. So I think businesses, if certainly if they're, they're trading spot, then they do need to look very carefully at the day-to-day -day movements. Obviously, we're not currency uh, advisors, but the best thing you can do for somebody uh, where they are trading cross-border is make sure they are getting good currency advice mm -hmm. and that people are looking at it not just as a way of actually sort of um, necessarily um, you know, making a gain but actually protecting the business. This is about risk and making sure that that currency movement doesn't come and actually wipe out um, you know, the profit in your, your business. This is about protecting the downside risk more than actually making an upside gain here. So that's certainly the way that um, I think uh, businesses tend to look at it, but they need to get proper advice around the currency and make sure that they've got a policy on it in how they're actually uh, um, dealing with that aspect of their business. Just to add to Nick's point, um, banks are um, offering better positions for call or put positions for uh, buying currency forwards or selling currency forwards. So if you're a small and medium-sized businesses, you don't have to worry too much. The banks are not going to entertain you. Um, we see a lot of banks uh, um, dealing with smaller amounts that uh, that they can buy forward or sell forward. So to add on Nick's point there, um, um, that is something you really want to take into consideration when you are dependent on uh, buying foreign products, uh, receiving in different currencies. It can all be a little bit tricky. One another way of doing it is, of course, natural hedging. And it's trying to make sure that you buy and sell in the same currency. Yeah. Uh, that could be an easier way to solve your problems. So look at your contracts and try and um, uh, standardize the, 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 the currency being used. And that's what we call natural hedging. So you don't have to worry about whatever happens to the pound or euro. Great. Now, in the last few minutes that we have, I'm going to kind of skip ahead and talk um, direct this to you, Jason, as we talked about the need for companies that plan to continue transacting business internationally between the EU and the UK. They're going to need to get some support and set up an entity outside of the UK. Can you talk about um, government support for making this move? Sure. Um, we, we, talk, we had a little session at Menzies uh, today as well, talking about some of the challenges businesses have, and we had a lot of government people also there. Um, government is not bad. <laughs> uh, they can be they can be a very uh, well. Of course, it depends on which part of the world you're from. That you might have a different opinion on that. But in especially in the in Europe, um, a lot of governments um, have set up a special wings. Uh, they call them investment agencies to facilitate uh, business owners um, in entering a new market. And they, this facilitation comes in all kinds of ways. One is uh, strategic introductions to potential buyers, sellers, uh, setting you up with uh, office space. Um, and, uh, and one point I'd like to talk about is on bank accounts. Um, what we see in our practice is um, one of the biggest challenges that uh, businesses face when, um, when entering a new market is opening up a bank account. Um, you know, back home, it's all perfect. You, you have your local banker and your best friends. You go out to the pub together. And the moment you say, we're going overseas and we need to open up a bank account there, you're public enemy number one. Um, and uh, surprisingly, a lot of companies face this. So uh, a piece of advice there, if you have a banker, go and establish a good relationship with them. Make sure they have um, an international connection um, that can help facilitate with that. Um, and if you can team up with the government, that's even better because governments, uh, a referral by a governmental organization to a bank uh, increases the chances of you opening up your bank by, I think, about 60 or 70 percent. Um, so getting in contact with government organizations to help you 
uh, get connected to banks can be very handy. Now about the last point about rolling out the orange carpet, um, this is something very particular to the Netherlands. Um, the Dutch government, um, if, you know, if you know a little bit about the Netherlands, we focus a lot about trade because we don't have much to offer. We have a bit of potatoes here and there, a lot of farmers. Um, so uh, welcoming in, inbound business to the Netherlands is a very important thing for us. Um, and it can go on all different angles. One is uh, uh, setting up visas for highly skilled migrants, uh, providing uh, English speaking schools, um, in the tax department, a lot of the, uh, the, the tax department um, uh, offices speak English, um, which makes doing business very easy as well. You can even opt to write in English to offices and in some cases even receive documentation from them in English. Um, this is quite unique uh, in comparison to other European countries when you're faced with a, a language that um, you don't understand. Um, so rolling out the, the, the orange carpet is uh, our way of say, saying that um, the Netherlands is, could be your uh, destination when you're uh, trying to use it as a gateway to coming into Europe. Great. Thank you so much. I, I'd like to again thank our panelists, Caroline Monk, Jason Marin, Ma Maria Raffinum, Nick Farmer, and Sean. And Sean, I didn't catch your last name. Sean Turner. Sean Turner. Sean Turner is also at Menzies. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, this webinar will be on the uh, HLB in internet very shortly, and our next webinar will take place at the third week in December. And that will be uh, led by Carlos Camacho from Costa Rica, and he will be covering the digital economy. Thank you very much and have a great day. Happy Thanksgiving to those celebrating in the US.